Greta also doesn't need much introduction because she's become one of the most well-known and most widely respected bloggers in the blogosphere. She is the author of Why Are You Atheists So Angry? 99 Things That Piss Off the Godless, which, by the way, is a really great book. I just absolutely loved it, and I've heard her speak about that in the past, too, at uh, uh, what uh, Paul Vidago calls the uh, mothership in, in Buffalo, our main facility in, in Amherst, New York. And uh, she's been writing about atheism and skepticism for her blog since 2005. And she's been a regular contributor for us and a number of other organizations. She's a regular columnist for Free Inquiry. And she is published also in numerous magazines, newspapers, and anthologies. She's also interested in LGBT issues and uh, issues of politics and culture. And I love this part, whatever crosses her mind. And I've been following her blog. She's got a great, a great mind. And she's a, she's a warm and thoughtful person. And I'm not supposed to go much off script. But uh, I'd like to introduce Greta Christina. Um, so hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Greta Christina. I write for the very cleverly named Greta Christina's blog. Um, and today I'm talking about, the topic of my talk is resistance is not futile. Is arguing about religion worth it? So is it worthwhile to argue with religious believers about religion? Yes. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think we have time for a few <laughs> questions. Um, okay, all right, all right. Cheap, cheap joke, not worthy of me. Um, and definitely not worthy of you. You deserve better. Um, so in all seriousness, yes, I do think that arguing about religion is very much worthwhile. I mean, to some extent, whether it's worthwhile depends on context. And of course, it's not the only form of activism we should be engaging in. You know, and if you personally don't want to try to talk religious believers out of their religion, I think that's valid. I certainly don't think it's morally required. But if you're somebody who currently doesn't argue with people about religion, either in public forums or private conversations, I'd like you to at least consider stepping out of your comfort zone and trying it. Um, I would certainly like you to question some of the assumptions you might be making uh, about arguing people out of their religion and trying to persuade them out of it. Um, and I would definitely like to persuade you that arguing about religion can be a valuable thing for other people to do, uh, even if you decide not to. Um, and for everybody here, whether you already confront people's religious beliefs or tend to stay away from that, um, I want to talk about some strategies for debating religion effectively. I want to talk about which situations it may or may not make sense to do it in. And I want to talk about what goals we should expect to accomplish by working to persuade people out of their religion. OK, so before I start, I want to spell one thing out very clearly. I am not, repeat not, talking about the tone wars here. I am not talking about confrontationalism versus diplomacy. That's a different conversation. I'm talking here about the actual content of what we say, um, regardless of the tone that we're saying it in. I mean, after all, you can be civil and friendly while you're trying to persuade somebody that God doesn't exist. Um, and you can be confrontational and obnoxious when you're advocating for an anti-atheist anti bigotry. So this is not about the tone wars. This is about whether trying to persuade people out of religion is worth doing, regardless of what tone it's done in. OK, is that distinction clear? Um, OK, so first, I want to challenge one of the most common assumptions that gets made about trying to persuade people out of their religion, and that's the assumption that it never works. A lot of atheists make this assumption. You know, when we talk about trying to argue people out of religion, they'll say, why do you waste your time? You know, it never works. Religious beliefs are too irrational. They're, all, they're held for emotional reasons and not rational ones, so you can't make rational arguments against them. Um, or else people will say, religious beliefs are, are too entrenched. People hold on to them too deeply. They'll never be persuaded out of them. Um, in a word, and I realize that this is spicy language for 9 o'clock in the morning, but in a word, bullshit. Um, this does work. Ask any atheist writer with even a moderately sized readership. Ask me, ask Jen McCrite, ask J.T. Eberhardt, ask P.Z. Myers. Ask any of us. We get emails all the time from people telling us, I am now an atheist in part 
because of you. I am now an atheist in part because of your arguments that you made against religion. And these aren't isolated. They're incidents. They're really common. Um, how many people here saw Bill Nye last night? Okay, well, most, yeah. It's a really awesome talk, really funny, really inspiring. Um, I, I thought it was a really great talk, but there was one thing he said a couple of times that I really disagreed with. He kept saying, we're never going to persuade an adult creationist out of creationism. You know, he said, we have to focus on the kids. Now, I have absolutely no problems with focusing on the kids. But literally 10 minutes after his talk was done, when I was leaving the hall, an older gentleman came up to me, introduced himself, um, said he was a fan of my blog, and said that he was new to atheism. He had just become an atheist a couple of years ago. And before that, he was wait for it, a young earth creationist. The timing of this was so perfect. If I believed in cosmic synchronicity and all that crap, I would totally think it was a, a sign from, from the stars. Um, and in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, I want to see a quick show of hands. How many people, first of all, how many people here are atheists or some sort of non-believers? Atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, whatever. Okay, that's most of you are a surprise. Okay, keep your hands up. If you used to be a believer, if you were blind but now you see, you used to be a believer and you're now a non-believer, keep your hands up. Okay, and then one more. How many of you became a non-believer, at least in part, not necessarily entirely, but in part, because of arguments against religion? How many of you had your process started or, or moved along or had the final nail in the coffin driven in because of an argument you read in a book, a blog, in a magazine, a conversation you had with somebody for why religion was mistaken and atheism was correct? If that's true for you, get your hands up and look around. That is not an insignificant number of people. That is not trivial. This does work. So why do so many people assume that it doesn't? Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for this pessimism. Uh, the first is overly ambitious expectations. I mean, yes, arguments against religion can and do persuade people out of their beliefs. It rarely does so right away. Um, I've gotten into lots of arguments with people about religion. And again, I get all these emails from people saying, your arguments persuaded me. I have never once started an argument that then ended in the course of that one argument with, oh, OK, you're right, there is no God. Um, and I've never talked to an atheist who has. I mean, a single conversation by itself is probably not going to convince somebody that their beliefs are mistaken. You know, religious beliefs are usually very deeply held. People usually do have them for emotional reasons. Um, and letting go of them can be scary. Um, it can be difficult. It can be traumatic uh, for emotional reasons and for practical reasons. You know, for most people, letting go of religion is a process. And while other people can help along with that process, ultimately it is something people need to do on their own. So if you're expecting to persuade somebody out of their beliefs in a single conversation, you're going to be very disappointed. And if you're like, oh, well, this never works because I had this argument with my friend and then at the end they were still a believer, that's, don't let that discourage you. Don't think of it as winning or losing an argument. Think of it as helping move somebody a little further along their path. Think of it as planting the seeds of doubt. Um, or, very importantly, think of it as nurturing seeds of doubt that are already there. Um, there's a point that I've recently started thinking about, and it's made me a lot more patient uh, when I get into arguments with believers about religion. If somebody is visiting your atheist group, if somebody is coming and you know commenting on an atheist blog that you're reading um, or an online forum, um, chances are they're already having doubts. You know, they're probably already having questions. People mostly don't visit atheist blogs and forums and groups and so on if they're not already a little bit curious about atheism. I mean, that's not universally true. Sometimes people are just trolling. But usually when people come to these forums, either in person or online, they're already having questions. And so you probably won't be able to demolish their faith in one big dramatic fell swoop but you might be able to put another little crack in the foundation or widen the cracks that are already there. Um, okay, so I do think that that's one reason many atheists are pessimistic about arguing against religion, overly ambitious expectations about what one argument can accomplish. Uh, but I think there's another important reason. Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been talking with a lot of people about, and there's this conclusion that I'm finding a little hard to avoid. I think many atheists convince themselves that arguing against religion is worthless 
because they personally don't want to do it. You know, they, they don't like confrontation, they're conflict averse, they don't want to alienate people. Um, they want a reason to not do it, and so they convince themselves that it's not possible. But you know what? You don't need a reason not to do this. I don't want to do this is a perfectly valid reason to not do this. If you don't want to try to argue people out of their religious beliefs, fine, don't do it. There's lots of ways to be an atheist activist. There are jobs for everybody, and we all have to go about it in our own way. You know, if you want to focus your arguments with believers on things like anti-atheist bigotry or church-state separation rather than does God exist, um, if, or if you don't even want to get into arguments with atheists, with believers at all, if you just want to be a positive model of happy, ethical, meaningful atheism, that is great. I am 100% behind you. That's all worth doing. We need people to do that. You know, if we're going to pry people out of religion, uh, we need to give them a safe place to land. Um, and I totally applaud people who are focusing their energies there. But take responsibility for that choice. You know, don't say, I don't argue about religion because it's always a waste of time. And definitely don't say, I don't argue about religion because it's a waste of time and you shouldn't either. Um, it's kind of a cop-out. Instead, say, I don't argue about religion because I don't like arguing about religion. I don't want to do it. Now, as you start saying that instead, uh, you might find yourself reconsidering your choice, or you might not. Um, but just take responsibility for that choice, and don't get in the way of other people who are making the opposite choice. We really are having an effect what we're doing works. Okay, so the little mini harangue is over. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you, if you weren't already convinced, that persuading people out of religion can be worth it. And now I want to talk about some specific strategies about how to go about it. Um, and um, at the end of the talk, I want to talk about what we can hope to accomplish by doing it. A couple of key points. First, very, very importantly, if you're going to argue with religion about, uh, if you're going to argue about uh, religion with believers, make sure that your arguments are good arguments. Um, I have seen some really bad atheist arguments against religion. It's not pretty. Um, make sure that your facts are straight. Make sure your logic is sound. Um, it's a really good idea to watch or listen to other people get into these arguments before you jump into the ring. Um, this is unfortunate psychological reality that I learned about recently. Um, that's that when people see a really, when people see a bad argument for something, we're then more likely to dismiss good arguments for it later on. It's like this inoculation against reason. Um, that particular vaccine, that's not one we want people to be getting. Do not inoculate people against reason. So if you don't make bad arguments so that they'll then not listen to the good ones later. Um, also, very importantly, remember to argue against ideas and not people. Uh, there's a huge difference between saying, that's a really stupid idea, and saying, you are so stupid. How stupid can you be? Um, you know, people, it's very likely any way that people are going to feel personally attacked when you critique their religion. People often take their religion very personally. Um, and I'll be getting into that a little bit more in a bit. Uh, but we don't have to make that worse than it has to be. You know, the people we're arguing with may get muddled about the difference between an attack on a person and a criticism of an idea, but we should be crystal clear about it. We should keep our noses clean. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, remember all those emails I get from people saying, your arguments help persuade me out of religion. There's a really important point I want to make about those emails, which is that they didn't come from the people I was arguing with. They came from the people who were lurking. They came from the people who were following the conversation. It's very possible that one of these people that I tangled with directly um, is now a full-fledged atheist because of those conversations we had. If they have... I don't know about it, they've never told me about it. It's the onlookers who have been persuaded. And so that's an important point to keep in mind about arguing over religion. The people you're trying to convince aren't necessarily the people you're arguing with. They're the people who are looking on, and that's true for big public debates, and it's also true for you know, just little arguments in online forums and Facebook and, and so on. And that brings me to a very important piece of strategy you might seriously consider having these debates publicly rather than privately one-on-one. -on -one. You know, if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm really concerned about your immortal soul, I'd like to sit down over coffee and talk with you about why you're an atheist. Don't just say, sure, why not? Say, sure, why not? Can I videotape the conversation and put it on YouTube? 
<laughs> um, if somebody you know email, uh, emails you responding to something you wrote about atheism um, and says, you know, I don't agree with that, and here's why, and let's debate, don't just email back and say, sure, let's debate. Email back and say, sure, let's debate. Can I post your letter on my Facebook page or my blog and discuss it with you there? So this accomplishes a couple of things. First of all, and very importantly for your own mental health, um, it screens out people who aren't serious. Um, as my colleague JT Eberhard has said about this topic, it is amazing how quickly their concern for your immor immortal soul vanishes when they're confronted with the possibility of making a fool of themselves in public. Um, and, and secondly, and I think more importantly, if they do say yes, they've given you a public forum for making your case. Um, and don't assume, by the way, that you don't have a public forum. Don't assume, well, sure, Greta, you know, she has this blog with thousands of readers. You know, what do I have? Don't assume you don't have a public forum just because you don't have a blog or a book deal or a podcast or whatever. If you're on Facebook, you have a public forum. If you're on any kind of social media, you have a public forum. If you have a phone that takes videos, uh, you can post conversations on YouTube. Um, you know, there are lots of ways to do this. We're living in the 21st century. Pretty much anybody has a public forum who wants one. And if you don't want to do that, if you don't feel, if you don't want to go on Facebook, um, you don't want to set up a YouTube channel, you don't really feel like setting up your own public forum, use other people's. You know, get into debates uh, on blog comment threads, uh, online discussions of news articles in, you know, newspapers on the web. Um, there's, there's lots of places where you can get into public debates about religion. Now, if we're talking about somebody that you're really close to, if we're talking about getting into arguments with your parents, your siblings, close friends, you might actually want to suspend this idea about having your conversations in public. You know, that whole thing about exposing them to public humiliation, you know, that's so awesome when it, we're talking about strangers or acquaintances, you know, you might want, not want to inflict, inflict that on the people that you really care about. Um, and in fact, I would actually counsel you to think really carefully about getting into arguments about religion with close friends or family at all. Um, you know, the reality is these arguments can be very divisive. They can be very upsetting. If you have religious people in your life that you really don't want to alienate, you really want to preserve that friendship, that relationship, you might decide to stay away from religion. Or at least keep your discussions about it limited to explaining your atheism and, you know, demolishing myths about it rather than trying to demolish their faith. Um, and, and see, here's the thing. Um, most atheists see religion as simply another idea about the world. It's a hypothesis about how the world works, why it is the way it is, that we should be able to discuss and debate like any other. But for many religious believers, their religion is more like an identity. You know, they see it more the way that gay people see being gay. Um, I don't think they're right about that. I, I'm not saying they're right about it. I don't think they are. But the reality is that that's how they see it. Um, and when you try to argue people that you love out of religion, I think a lot of times what they hear is not, I think you're mistaken about that idea. I think a lot of times what they hear is, I don't love you the way you are. Um, you know, it's like you're arguing against their very existence personally. Um, and so with people you're really close to, people you don't want to alienate, you might decide that's not worth it. Now, very important clarification. Um, I do think that it is totally fine, worthwhile, to get into debates with people you love about things like why atheism is okay. You know, whether atheists can be moral, happy, meaningful, and so on. And after all, that's about them accepting you the way you are. And you absolutely have, you know, it's completely right and, and valuable to stand up for that. And the thing is, it can actually be very tricky to draw that line. It can be very tricky to draw the line between simply explaining your atheism and arguing for why it's right. I mean, there's this reality that atheists sometimes have a hard time accepting. You know, we say things like, you know, we put up our billboard saying you can be good without God, and all these people got really offended. You know what? There is no way to say I don't believe in God without implying if you do believe in God, you're wrong. There's no way to do that. No matter how many pretty pictures of blue skies and clouds you put behind your words, and I, I love the blue skies and clouds billboards saying, you, you know, don't believe in God, you're not alone. But the implication of that is, do believe in God? We don't think you're right about that. Um, you know, to, to, in a sense, simply saying I am an atheist is starting an argument about religion. Unless, of course, they're an atheist too. Um, <laughs> 
you know, so it, it can be really hard to draw the line between explaining to the people, just sharing that with them who you are in your life, explaining this is why an a I'm an atheist, and saying this is why I think religion is bunk. Um, so I think that we have to accept that. Uh, when we're talking about whether to get into arguments with people about religion, we're not really talking about whether. We're talking about how much. And so it's, it's not about do this or don't do this. It's about where to draw that line. So I get that this is a difficult topic. These conversations can be really contentious. These conversations can be upsetting. Um, you know, and there's this kind of, there's this conflict, which is that if you argue with people you love about religion, it may alienate them. If you don't, you may feel like you're being dishonest and like you're putting up a wall in between you and that alienates them in a different way. Um, I'm not going to tell you which to do and, you know, I'm, and I'm also not going to say that arguing with people that you're really close to, that you're really close to about religion is always a bad idea. I think it can often be a good idea. Um, I've heard from a number of atheists who have found these debates about religion with the people they care about to actually be really productive. Uh, some people, they've, they've resulted in persuading the people they love out of religion and into atheism. Sometimes it hasn't done that, but it's resulted in the people that we love understanding atheism better, and you know, it's resulted in us understanding better. Um, you know, and I've certainly heard from atheists themselves who have deconverted. Again, you know, it's like remember the hands that were up who have deconverted because of arguments they had with people they care about about religion. So I'm not saying never, ever, ever, ever do this. Um, I'm saying just be aware these conversations can be painful. Uh, they can be divisive. Um, if you decide not to go there, I'm not going to blame you. If you do go there, just be careful. Okay, so moving on. Uh, there's another really important strategy point uh, about debating religion, and this is one that it took me a depressingly long time to learn. You're not going to find a magic bullet. You are not going to find the one perfect argument that persuades every religious person out of their beliefs. Believe me, if that existed, that's all atheist bloggers would ever be saying over and over again. That's the only argument we would ever use. It's the only thing we would ever say. Um, it doesn't exist. Um, and that's not just because religion is held for emotional reasons and so on. It's because different arguments work with different people. Um, I actually once did this admittedly very informal, very unscientific poll on my blog. I was asking atheist readers of my blog who had once been believers, I was asking them what persuaded you to change your mind. And I will admit, I was looking for the magic bullet. I was totally like, I, what I want is for 80% of people to say X. This is what persuaded me. Um, didn't get it. Um, first of all, there's a tremendous variety of responses. There were a few that came up a lot, but there was nothing that stood out as the one big magic bullet <laughs> argument. But second, and really importantly, a lot of people gave more than one answer. For a lot of people, becoming an atheist was a process. It took lots of different ideas coming together and falling into place. You know, the process is often like this. You know, I started having questions about God, uh, how God could be good and still, you know, create sickness and natural disasters. And then I asked my clergy person these questions, and the answers they gave me really weren't satisfying. And then I read the Bible, and boy, that sure shot holes in a whole lot of things. And then I started talking to my atheist friends, and they started making some really good points that I couldn't really counter. And then I read The God Delusion, and then it was all over. Um, <laughs> you know, you know this, 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 the number of people who have said The God Delusion was the nail in the coffin, it's amazing. Um, it, it's often, this is often a process, and lots of ideas go into that. Um, so remember, you're not gonna find a magic bullet. If you're looking for it, you're gonna get frustrated. Different arguments work on different people, and some people need to hear more than one argument. And that brings me to a very important principle of debating religion with believers, and that's patience. This patience can be a very challenging principle to remember. Um, I'm sure that each of us has heard all of the bad arguments for religion approximately 800 times. And when we hear it from for the 801st time, it can make us just want to scream and throw things. I mean, there's times when I think, if I hear Pascal's freaking wager, one more time, the top of my head is going to come off. <laughs> um, but it's really important to remember. these. Yes, these arguments are really old, so old to most of us. They're probably not old to the people we're arguing with. These may be very new ideas to the people that we're arguing with. A lot of believers have never seriously considered the foundations of their belief, um, and they've never encountered serious opposition to them. 
So we need to be willing to make our case again and again and again with each new person we're engaging with. We have to remember, yes, okay, this is the 500,000 million billion trillionth time that we've discussed why Pascal's wager is logically and morally bankrupt, but they've maybe never thought of that before. We need to be patient. Um, if we're gonna get into the arguments, we have to have treat them, remember that this is their first time and try to treat it as if it was our first time too. Um, so there's one more point that I really think we need to consider uh, when we're debating uh, religion with believers. Actually, lots more than one point. I have lots to talk about, but I, you know, we're, you know, I need to start winding up soon. Um, and that question is, if we succeed, if we change their minds and they realize, oh, there is no God, huh? What am I going to do about that? We need to give them a safe place to land. Um, I, I think that we. You know, it's like we have to think about, if they do change their minds about religion, are they going to have access to the things that religion once provided for them? Are they going to have access to community, support systems, uh, philosophies of life, ways of coping during hard times, ways of dealing with, with death and with grief? Um, I think we need to consider this for ethical reasons. You know, if we succeed in persuading somebody out of religion, I think we have something of an obligation to help give them a safe place to land. And eventually people generally do feel better and happier once they've left religion. Uh, there's a fair amount of studies showing that, you know, atheists, after they've left religion and they've resolved their cognitive dissonance, you know, by saying, oh yeah, no religion, never, what about that? Usually people feel better and happier with their lives, but sometimes the process can be traumatic. Um, and if we're gonna try to persuade people into making that transition, I do think we have something of an obligation to, to make it easier. Um, and I also think we need to consider this question for purely practical, purely Machiavellian reasons, purely reasons of winning. Um, you know, people do often have a hard time even considering the arguments against religion if they think that letting go of religion is going to be traumatic or dangerous. You know, I know that this is going to come as enormous shock to all of you. Brace yourselves, hang on to the table. People are not always rational. People do not consider arguments purely on the basis of their merits. And by the way, that includes atheists. We are not, you know, model robots of perfect rationality and, and awesome reasoning. Um, you know, we do, we, we do, all of us, human beings, it's how our brains are wired. Uh, we do consider arguments based on what we already believe, based on what we want to believe, based on what we would find easy and comfortable to believe. And so if we wanna persuade believers that religion is mistaken, I think one of the most powerful things we can do is to reassure them that being an atheist is okay. Um, now, I could give an entire talk about how to do that, about what that means, how to create the safe place to land. Um, I'm not gonna do that. I promise to not shoehorn an entire other talk into this one. Um, I don't really have time to give this topic justice. I just wanna touch on a few really basic ideas. Um, I think if we wanna give uh, people a safe place to land when we persuade them out of religion. Uh, we can make atheism more visible. Uh, we can provide more examples of happy, productive, ethical atheists with meaning and joy in our lives. Uh, I think we can make atheist communities stronger and more welcoming. Uh, I think we can look at the things that religion provides for people, things like you know, social support, economic support in hard times, networking, counseling, safety nets, daycare, activities for families, uh, rituals, rites of passage. Um, avenues for charitable and social justice work, um, community events that are inspiring and fun, just ongoing companionship and continuity. These are the things that people get from religion, and if we want to pry people out of religion, I think that we should do what we can to give them, to create them and provide them for people. Um, I think that we can make atheist communities more welcoming to a wider and more diverse range of people than we've traditionally focused on. Again, whole other talk that I could shoehorn, but I don't have time for it. Um, I think we can talk more publicly about what gives atheists a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Um, I think we can talk more publicly about atheist philosophies of death and how atheists handle grief. You know, one of the main things that people fear about losing religion um, is having to face death without a belief in a god or an afterlife. Um, I think we need to be less shy about the topic of death. I think we need to be more willing uh, to get our secular approaches to death and grief into the public square. Again, there's an entire other talk there, but um, I'll have to give that another time. 
Um, and, and very importantly, if we want to give atheists a safe place to land when we pry them out of religion, probably the number one thing we can do is to just come out, to just come out as atheists as much as we can and to be as open about our atheism as we can. You know, when people just see that atheists exist and are living good lives and happy lives, that's probably the number one thing we can do to make atheism seem like a feasible option that they could really consider. You know, and then they can consider, you know, the, the argument based on its merits because they're not terrified of it. Um, I have a lot more to say about all of this, but I am running out of time, and uh, I want to move on from these tactical questions, and I want to get back to this really big, exciting strategy question. At least it's exciting for me, because I am a giant nerd. Um, um, I started this talk uh, by asking a very big question. Which goals of the atheist movement will be helped by trying to persuade people out of religion? And honestly, I think the answer is all of them. Seriously, I think every single goal that we have as, the, as, as an atheist community and an atheist movement is helped by trying to argue religious believers out of religion. You know, I do think absolutely, if you're doing alliance work with religious believers on issues you have in common, then yes, temporarily it absolutely makes sense to put those arguments aside. I mean, that's, isn't that kind of the essence of alliance work? We work together on things we have in common. We agree temporarily to set aside things we disagree about. Um, you know, if you're doing service projects with a religious group, if you're working on church-state separation with a progressive religious organization, absolutely, temporarily, for the purposes of that project, put the arguments about does God exist on hold. But you shouldn't have to put that conversation aside permanently. Interfaith or other coalition work should never come at the cost of atheists having to shut up permanently about our objections to religion. That cost is way too high. Um, and I would argue this, the attempt to persuade people out of religion, it doesn't just help the goal of creating a world without religion. I mean, that's obviously that's a big part of what it does. You know, more atheists helps all of our, all of our causes. But it also helps our other goals, you know, like reducing anti-atheist bigotry um, and improving separation of church and state. Um, I think it's going to help us create a world where atheism is more accepted and where religion's special privilege status is dimish, diminished or even eliminated. You know, and I know that that's, people are going, wait, how can arguing about people's religious beliefs make them feel better about us? Okay, here's why. Arguing about religion doesn't just have the effect of persuading people out of religious beliefs. It also repositions religion as just another idea about the world an idea that can be criticized and questioned just like any other. It strips religion of its special privileged status. I'm sure we are all familiar about how religion gets treated as a special case. You know, any critique of religion gets treated as disrespectful. Um, people treat religion with kid gloves, even in arenas that usually encourage and support vigorous debate. I'm sure we are all familiar with how religion gets a free ride. I mean, religion gets a free ride in a freaking armored car. When we argue against religion, we're putting an end to that free ride. We're slashing the tires on that armored car. And that helps all of the fights that we're fighting. It makes the fight for church-state separation easier. Uh, when people see religion as just another idea about the world, I think they're less likely to demand that their particular religious ideas be taught in the public schools or posted in public buildings. Um, when people see religion as just one more idea about the world, I think they're less likely to give special exemptions to people who happen to hold this idea. You know, exemptions like all these tax exemptions that we've been talking about. Um, exemptions like letting believers deny medical care to their kids. Exemptions like giving them a pass on safety standards for their daycare centers. You know, nobody would say, well, you know, you should have be licensed and have safety standards for your daycare center, but your daycare center is based on libertarianism, you know, or it's based on some other idea, you know, it's based on, you know, existentialism, you know, or it's, you know, it's based on, um, you know, some other philosophical idea. Therefore, you don't have to obey the law about making your daycare center safe. And I think that we need to shift the conversation and go, why should a daycare center that's based on, it's a Baptist daycare center, be treated with any differently than a daycare center that was a libertarian daycare center? And I think that arguing about religion and treating it as just another idea about the world 
shifts that perspective. And I think that this reframing of religion also makes the fight against anti-atheist bigotry easier. You know, when people see religion as just another idea about the world, they're more likely to see atheism as just another idea about the world. You know, one whose adherents are just as likely to be good and honest, you know, and happy as anybody else. Even if they disagree with the idea of atheism, they're less likely to see atheists as wicked and scary just on the face of it. Um, and what's more, I think that if we can successfully reframe religion as an idea that can be legitimately debated, I think that that helps move it away from being an identity that people see as a core part of their being. And if you know anything about cognitive dissonance and rationalization, you know that people are better able to hear disagreement when they don't feel like their core identity is being attacked. You know, whether we're battling, you know, specific harmful manifestations of religion like faith healing or something like that, or whether we're battling the entire idea of religious faith, I think people are going to be more receptive to, the, to our arguments if they see religion as an idea that they might be mistaken about instead of a core part of their being that's being called stupid or bad. Again, arguing against religion doesn't just persuade people out of religion. It doesn't just add to our numbers. It repositions religion as just another idea about the world. It strips religion of its free ride, and that helps all of the fights that we're fighting. Thank you. I have to ask the expert, we'll call him Tom Flynn. Should we take questions now? Or? I, I go with questions speaker by speaker. Uh, so yes, yeah, so if, uh, if anybody has any questions. Greta? Hi. You mentioned that um, there's no silver bullet or no magic bullet uh -huh. and no single argument is most effective. Uh -huh. But in trying to help us to argue about religion, would you mind just giving us uh, three or four or five of the major arguments that you have found effective so That's, we have a, are a little better equipped. Yeah, so you, you, you want the arsenal. You're not going to find the magic bullet, but you want the arsenal. A little bit of it, um, A little bit of it. Um, some of the arguments that people found mo have found most effective against religion, uh, one of them is definitely the problem of evil. The problem of evil is, the problem of evil is very hard for believers in an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God to reconcile. Um, we, you know, when we start talking about, and you can talk about human evil, but they'll always say, oh, free will, and that's a long conversation to get into. Tsunamis, birth defects, pediatric cancer, droughts, famine, that, that's a really good argument against, certainly against the all-powerful, all-good God. And once you've cracked that foundation, then they're more likely to let go of any belief. Um, uh, the uh, existence of other religions. You know, it's like the question of, you know, you believe in your religion, somebody else down the street believes in something completely different, why should I believe that you're right and they're wrong? Um, that's huge. Um, and then there's, a, I, this is a long conversation and there's other people with questions, so I'll give you just one more. Get people to read their own religious texts. Seriously, the number of people who said, I, the, the thing that convinced me out of Christianity was reading the Bible, the thing that convinced me out of uh, Islam was reading the Quran. Just get people to read their own religious text. And you know, you can, if you can have your little arsenal of, here is all the really ridiculous and horrible stuff that your religious text says, do you believe that? And if you don't believe that, and you be then why believe any of it? Um, that's, that can be really powerful. So uh, next question. Howdy. I have had to, I can completely relate to you with debating. I've had to debate several times that I'm not a Satanist, not a Druid, or not a Jew. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, since most of the people I interact with are high school students, mm -hmm. if you have uh, any specific debating strategies for people of that age group. Or if anything uh, works better. Debating strategies for high school students. I'm probably not the best person to ask that, honestly. The, the people to talk to about that would be, honestly be other high school students. Um, what I can say is that high schoolers, there's this tendency towards conformity that you're probably very familiar with. Um, you know, it's like high schoolers tend to be more swayed by everybody's doing it. Um, and so, and also high schoolers are obviously younger and they, these are issues that they may just not have con seriously considered. Um, you know, you really may be the first atheist that they've met. Um, 
And so, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not the best person to say, here are the arguments that really work with high schoolers. Um, what I would say is be aware that even more than, than with people who are older than you are, um, you're really gonna be their atheism 101. And so you're gonna be sort of having to fight on a lot of fronts. So you're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of moving goalposts, you know, as I'm sure you've, you've encountered. Um, so again, just, just be patient with that. I wish I had a better answer for you. Thank you very much. Hi, I've increased my comfort level with saying I'm an atheist or I'm going to a humanist convention just by doing it. But then I'm be, uh, met by talk about tsunamis, these tsunamis of silence. What do you do to fill that silence after you've said this <laughs> A word? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so that's a good question. It's like, you know, once you say that you're an atheist and then it's sort of like the you get the crickets. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you do? And I think that kind of depends on your personality. You might decide it's like to say do you have any questions about that you seem uncomfortable about that you know it's it's you know do you want to talk about that um you know you can fill that science with that silence with more talk about your atheism and your humanism or you can just change the subject and have it be you know not even change the subject but just say yeah i'm going to this humanist conference and it's in tacoma and there's this beautiful you know glass art museum and and that kind of makes it more of like a no big deal it's like it's just like any other topic. And different people have different ways of liking to engage about that. Some people are like, they really want to be on topic. They want to be the, you know, the, the PR person for atheism. Um, and so if you get met with the silence and fill that science with, with silence with more talk about, you know, atheism, or again, asking, do you have any questions about that? Um, that can be really useful. Um, or just say, you know, whatever. Hi, you said earlier that uh you thought it was almost impossible to announce that I am an atheist, for example, without uh, implying that the other person is an idiot. Let me Not an idiot, mistaken. I, I'm exaggerating Different. for effect. Uh, let me suggest if you say the God idea doesn't work for me, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with the other person. They mm -hmm. can't argue with it. Uh -huh. And if they then say, well, are you an atheist then? you have uh, created a rather gentle lead in to uh -huh. the whole conversation. Yeah. And and yeah, and that is something that, you know, some people decide when they come out as atheist instead of just saying I'm an atheist, I'll say things like religion doesn't work for me, I'm not religious. The thing about that is that ultimately, and yes, that can be a softer opening. Um, but ultimately the question of religion is not a subjective question. You know, it's like the question of does God exist? It's not like religion does, the reason religion doesn't work for me is not the reason that opera doesn't work for me. You know, that's, you know, opera doesn't work for me, that's a subjective issue of taste. The reason religion doesn't work for me is that God doesn't exist. And ultimately, that's what you're saying. You know, it's like, and I would actually, I don't like it when people treat, when atheists treat religion or atheism as if it were a subjective question of opinion. I do think we need to acknowledge that this is a question of fact and the facts are on our side. Um, but you're right, I think that you're right that it can be a softer opening. It can be a softer way of opening the door. Hello, Jim Downard, Spokane Secular Society. And I also have kind of a double hat here because I'm the atheist blogger at the Spokane Faith and Values website, which was quite an interesting little operation. I took over from our previous secular society and when I took over the position, um, and they're relatively uh, a broad ranging, fairly liberal, uh, pro feminist uh, group of Christians and uh, uh, Jews, and there's some uh, Muslims and Sikhs. It's a it's a broad religious community that they that they have represented there, and it was not terribly controversial. But some eyebrows had been raised when they'd started to have a, an atheist blogger to begin with. When I took over the position, I expressly wanted to have an ask an atheist button, so that. I could get feedback directly from people, and that means it was a perfect opportunity to be able to discuss things sure. because they're expressing their own concerns or curiosity about what I believe, and then I can respond particularly to it. I've never had to cut my, uh, trim my sails in any of my discussion. It was particularly ironic because I took over it uh, in the June of earlier in the year at the time that the Bible series was appearing on the History Channel. So my first blogs were specifically targeted at that, and I offered a lot of the same criticisms that you would uh, of this, and uh, what was interesting about it is I never got any pushback from people disputing the facts I was giving or the argument that I was giving. Mm -hmm. So this was an opportunity, and two, one thing that I've learned from my own experience is that people in a blog context will be much more apt to be a little tighter and a little more 
argumentative and a little less personable in that context than that same person who I have met in many instances on a one-to-one -one basis. And so you have to kind of tailor your responses to sort of ratchet down the, the intensity when you're dealing in a blog context and deal on a more personal basis when you're talking. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point actually is, and again, this, could, this talk could have been three hours long easily. Um, we, when we're debating about religion, um, there is this tendency, there's a real difference between conversations online and conversations in person. I think we're all familiar with that. And there is this tendency with online conversations for things to get really, really heated, uh, for us to sort of forget that there's another actual human being on the end of, that, of, of the line, um, to really focus just on the intellectual arguments and not you know, sort of tune into the emotional nuances of what's going on. So I do think that there is a difference between online debates and in-person debates and um, that it's worth, um, if you're getting into online debates, I think they're hugely powerful. You know, the internet is an enormous part of why atheism is as strong and healthy as it is today. Um, but do be careful of that tendency uh, for things to get really, really heated, really nasty, um, and to, to kind of go south and just keep an eye on that. Especially if you're getting into online arguments with people that you really care about. I'm so sorry, we have time for one more question. One more question. I'm a uh, forester, not a, a religious scholar, and I have no interest in becoming a religious scholar. But, so I find myself in a, at a disadvantage when I get into a, a religious argument. Is there any, any tack I should take, you know, to, to uh, avoid uh, trying to discuss fine points of the religion and the Bible? Uh, um. Um, you know, honestly, most people who are involved in this community aren't religious scholars. I'm not a religious scholar. You know, some of our best debaters, Matt Delahunty is one of our best debaters, and he's not a religious scholar. He's this guy who used to be a believer. He used to be a preacher, I think. And he's just done a lot of reading. You know, he's just done a lot of reading, and he's had a lot of conversations. Um, so what I would say is, you know, if you're going to get into these debates, you know, familiar yourself, you're, familiarize yourself with the basics. You don't really need, you know, you don't need a PhD in biblical studies to get into debates with religious believers. Probably the best thing to do is to start reading or listening to other debates that people are having. You'll get an idea of the kinds of things, the themes that come up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. They don't really have any new ideas. Um, if they did, you know, we wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> so that's the main thing I would say. Don't think that because you're not a biblical scholar that you can't get into these debates. Most people in this movement aren't. I just have to, I insist. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I, I wish you would talk more about approaching this uh, question a little obliquely and talk directly to the politics of religion and ask religious people without attacking or questioning their religion, what does your religion do with the money and their tax exemption? Do you think, talk to them about the equitability of what their religion is doing mm -hmm. and give facts like, did you know the Mormon church built a $3 billion commercial mall with your tax dollars? Yeah. And what do they do for the rest of the world? Yeah. The same with Scientology or Westbury Baptist. Yeah. And there's a whole list that you have yeah. that confronts people and ask them to question their own church. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that's, it, you know, it's like, again, the, the, the question about what are some of the good arguments, um, and I didn't really have time to get into them, but that's one of the ones that also makes religious believers really have to stop and think is, if you're saying that your religion makes people better people, why are your religious believer, leaders and religious organizations acting like such jerks? Um, and then that can sort of get into two conversations. It can get to the conversation about church-state separation, and it can also get into the conversation of, of the more philosophical conversation about why, you know, again, you know, you say that your religion makes you a better person. Where's the evidence for that? So thank you. Thank you.